I live in Colorado, and when my family moved here, we were all so excited to be living in such a new place, close to everything we love. I was outside all the time with my friends, exploring our little town. More than anything, I loved hiking up in the mountains. It was beautiful and so wild up here. And one day, while I was out on a hike, I actually ran into this little coyote pup. He had been caught in his leg in a trap. He was nervous and wasn't able to get loose without any help. This coyote pup managed to bite me, but not enough to break the skin. I was fortunate and able to help him get free from the trap. I've noticed too that coyotes are overrunning the place. They're everywhere. They're all over the towns and fields, you name it. They are. And it's gotten so bad that people actually have to keep their pets inside around here in this small little town. They're worried that these coyotes will get to them. At least where I live. What scares me the most is just how similar this coyote pup looked to a German Shepherd. Kind of like a wolf-dog hybrid. It wasn't exactly natural. Well, later on that evening, my family and I were driving in the car and we saw three coyotes. The way they looked was so weird. Extra shaggy fur, but also kind of mangy. Their fur was matted and dark. One of them, in particular, the leader, had long pointy ears and bright yellow eyes, looking completely different from the other two. It even stared directly into our car window at us. And not to mention, its face looked much different than a regular coyote's. It almost had a, dare I say, human quality to it. And I knew something wasn't quite right. Coyotes aren't supposed to act this way. They're supposed to be afraid of humans. And after the night of the drive, we began having these strange-looking coyotes appear all around our house at nighttime. They did things that really set me off into the land of terror. Standing upright walking around like a person would. They would walk around the house, howl and scratch along the walls and the door, and then disappear for the night. It was the most terrifying thing. And then things got even worse. One night, when I was walking out to the car in the parking lot behind a house, a coyote began growling at me, parking from behind some bushes. It came out running after me, but didn't attack. Instead, I think it was trying to bluff charge. When I told my parents about this, they were so freaked out, they immediately called my uncle, who lives up in Colorado Springs, a big city about an hour south of us. My uncle has been living there for years with his family, next to a huge open space filled with all kinds of wildlife, including, but not limited, to coyotes. He told them that these things that we have been experiencing is not normal especially for coyotes. We've been having these kinds of incidents for almost a year now. Another night, as I was leaving my house, I began to check out of my spot, and a coyote appeared at the front of my car's headlights, glowing yellow eyes looking directly into mine. It snarled, but never made any movement. Now, this coyote was standing upright like a person, reminding me of a werewolf. It was something like out of a nightmare. I didn't know what to do. And then it just kind of walked away into the darkness, disappearing for good. It has now gotten so bad that my family is afraid to come outside at night. And we've all been feeling this constant fear looming over us. And it's all gotten so bad that my family is afraid to come outside at night. We've all been feeling this constant fear looming over us when we leave home for anything. There are these things everywhere, and more of them as the days go on. They're multiplying like crazy. This has to mean more than just a coyote population that has clearly gotten out of control. There's something much more sinister at work here, and I know it. The only thing I can think of is that we actually have real-life werewolves, or where coyotes, or that these things are actually skinwalkers. Is this true?
I work for a delivery company, delivering food to different restaurants. Sometimes I deliver to fast food restaurants, and sometimes I deliver to nicer chain restaurants. Regardless, I reside in northern Florida for the most part, and 2019 has been a beautiful year. I was driving at about 2 in the morning, and suddenly I saw this strange bipedal creature thing standing next to the road. It just stood there, staring at me, and as soon as I saw it, my heart began racing. That creature would have looked terrifying to anybody who saw it. It stood about average height for a man, but kind of had a lizard's face, very big eyes, but it still looked human in some ways. I know that sounds unnerving. I'm not entirely sure what this thing was, but it made me so terrified that I couldn't stop shaking for the next half hour. As I approached closer, it kind of stepped back into the thicket. I drove by it, and it kept looking at me in the shadows with its bright yellow-green eyes. I can't believe how scared I was, but this thing was really frightening. As I drove past it, I kept realizing there was no way this could have been a person at all. It was clearly a bipedal animal of some kind. It was gross looking and had green eyes. It kind of reminded me of some sort of lizard man or something. I don't know. I didn't stop when I saw it. I was too petrified with fear and felt like if I stopped and confronted this thing, it would somehow have killed me. If there is any advice for somebody at your organization about how to act when seeing a cryptid like this one, please tell me what it is so next time I end up seeing this thing, which is hopefully never, it won't kill me. My grandparents are originally from Africa, and we still have family over there. My grandmother especially loved to tell us stories all about her childhood growing up there and all the adventures she would get into. She was still very close to a sister and her family who were still over there. The wonders of the internet. This meant they were able to chat and it was cute to see this amazing old lady gossiping away from her couch in the US with her sister, otherwise known as my great aunt, all the way across the world in Africa. When it was going to be my grandmother's 80th birthday, both she and my grandfather were still in tremendous health, despite their advancing years. We decided to throw her a surprising party, inviting her sister. Not being in the best of health herself, my great aunt needed to bring her own son and daughter-in-law with her, but my father offered to pay for everybody, and it was settled. We were excited to actually meet the people we'd only seen via Zoom, yet heard so much about. One afternoon, not too long before the surprise event happened, I was asking my grandmother about the family, trying not to be too obvious, but wanting to hear more stories about the people I would soon be meeting. As usual, she happily spoke to her sister, and then made a strange comment. She confided that her sister wasn't happy about her son's marriage, as she could have been, that my great-aunt was suspicious of her daughter-in-law, and even worried about her son, whose health seemed to have taken a sudden nosedive ever since the couple were married. And before his wife, he was a strong man, huge personality, and a wide grin. Now he seemed withdrawn, tired all the time, and had lost a ton of weight. He often didn't come and see his mother for weeks on end, when they used to be so close before. This all seemed pretty sad to me, but what did I know about marriage and relationships? I was still in high school at the time, so I shrugged it off. The days before the party were hectic and stressful, so much to organize and needing to keep it secret. My great aunt's daughter-in-law, the one she was so suspicious of, had made life even harder insisting she bring a ridiculous amount of luggage, including an oversized trunk filled with God only knows what. When we picked them up from the airport, she was even quite rude about it, sitting it in the back with her, 
making the rest of us squeeze into the minivan, surrounded by bags. They were staying at our house since we had plenty of room. I also noticed immediately what my great aunt had meant regarding her son. Although I'd only seen photos, he always seemed a big, friendly man, and now meeting him in person, he shrunk, barely saying a word. It all came to a head that night of the party. My mom loves animals, and we have a house full, four cats and three dogs. Thankfully, all of them were super friendly, but in case any of the guests were afraid or allergic, the dogs got to stay in the yard, and the cats were taken upstairs. One of them, Luca, just craves attention, though, and was pouncing on anybody who popped up to use the bathroom for some affection. I had been busy helping everybody get drinks, providing grandmother with Kleenex as she sobbed happy tears at the wonderful surprise. Even though I was rushing about, I still noticed my great aunt's son looking worn out, and his wife kept disappearing upstairs. In the end, I followed her up, quietly so she didn't see me. I saw her slip into the room where they were staying in. Again, she displayed a rudeness despite us looking after her, and we had made it clear when she arrived that although they were extremely grateful, they didn't want anybody entering their room during this day. She'd keep it clean and tidy. There was no need to go in. I looked around for Luca, expecting her to come rushing over for a cuddle, but she was nowhere to be seen. I peeked into my parents' room, and the other three cats were all asleep, piled up on the bed, but no sign of Luca. Then I heard a mewling sound, the very noise Luca makes when she is distressed, which is almost never since she is a happy and friendly cat. It was coming from my room. My great aunt's daughter-in-law was staying in, the one she had just gone into, I crept over, listening at the door, and I could hear Luca meowing, sounding in pain. I didn't care about being a good hostess anymore. I was worried for my cat, so I threw open the door and screamed. There on the floor was a lamba, a snake with a human head, the head of my great aunt's son, and the head was eating Luca. I had heard of this creature from the stories grandmother would tell. A powerful creature created by black magic, a witch doctor, made from the fingernails and blood, and is intrinsically linked to a human counterpart. The person who had made it, in this case the wife, who was all along indeed a witch doctor, controls this thing and the human. They do her bidding no matter what. But when this creature gets tired and hungry, so will the human. She screamed it needed to feed, slamming the door and screaming in my face. If the cat isn't enough, I'll take you as well. Just as I was thinking I was snake food, the door flew open and my dad rushed in. He had took one look at this creature and shot it in the head. It turns out, he'd come upstairs to use the private half bath in his bedroom, heard the shouting and screams, grabbed the gun he keeps in his bedside table and rushed to see what was happening, thinking maybe somebody had broken in, hoping to steal something during the noise and commotion of the party downstairs. When he'd seen the monster on the floor, instinct told him to shoot first, ask questions later, especially as he saw the bloody half-eaten Luca hanging out of its jaws. Thankfully, the spell broke and my uncle came out of whatever trance he'd been under and he was able to confront his wife. There was nothing much they could do here. Could you even imagine telling an American cop that you'd witnessed an African mythical snake monster with a human head? But as soon as they got back to Africa, he divorced her and never saw her after that. As far as my story goes, I understand that the way I'm writing it, and even writing it to you, will probably be passed along as creepypasta, but... I'm sure many paranormal, scary events are written off as that too. Hopefully, you can believe something like this. I love any kind of extreme sports. 
I'm always up for the challenge. By day, I'm a firefighter, so I find things like mountain climbing and parachuting out of airplanes help kind of relieve some of the stresses and pressures of everyday work. It also means I'm fully trained in emergency medical procedures. So, oftentimes, people invite me along on their crazy stints in case of accidents. We've seen some beautiful sights, nature and all its glory, and we've also had some hairy moments, including a buddy of mine falling pretty far down a cliff edge. Thankfully, he managed to get away with just a broken leg and a telling off from his wife. But once in a while, we will come across something not so good or completely unexplainable. Again, being a firefighter, I've seen some real messed up stuff. House fires are bad, but car crashes are the worst. So my tolerance for blood and body parts is pretty high. Now, one thing I'm not fond of is small, enclosed, and dark spaces. So yeah, I guess you could say I have a mild claustrophobia. I can mask it during work. As soon as I put on the uniform, I'm on autopilot. No room for any fears like that when you gotta crawl into some tiny space to rescue an infant. But to raise the adrenaline to try and combat this anxiety, a buddy and I decided to go caving or spelunking for you professionals. Being inside a cramped, dark space where your footing could potentially lead to an accident at any moment is both exhilarating and terrifying. As with any extreme activity I've tried, including swimming with sharks, I was beginning to see why people who enjoy their hearts stopping at various moments to do this, when something in front of me moved, and my buddy, the only other person there, was behind me. Now, we were in full protective and safety clothing, including headlamps, so we could keep our hands free, and I spun in the direction of the noise. The beam from my helmet revealing a very tight tunnel not too far in front of us, and the distinct shape of a large form standing near to the opening. It looked to be as big as us, which could mean only one thing, a bear. Only I couldn't work out how it could be since we had squeezed ourselves through the cave mouth. A bear would be much more broader and way less flexible, and it would have to leave, else how would it feed? Whatever the thing was didn't like the light, and it made this horrendous skittering type sound. It then rushed close to us. Maybe it was so disorientated by the light, it didn't realize it was coming at us, rather than away, and turned into the tunnel, and was right then that we could see what it was. With the light from both headlamps, we could clearly make out that it was a giant lizard person. That is the only way I can describe it. When I first looked directly at it, I couldn't believe that even for one second, I thought it could have been a bear. This thing was indeed tall, but it was also skinny and very pale, covered in scaly skin. It stood on two legs, each limb long like a human. This all led up to a very lizard-like head, complete with the side eyes and a long snout with a tongue that darted in and out. It then made a chittering noise and we could hear footsteps coming from the direction of the tunnel ahead, and I just turned to my buddy and yelled, Run! I have no idea how many of those things were there. Maybe the acoustics of the cave just made it sound worse, but there was no way we were waiting to find out. We turned back and ran as safely as we could, not even stopping when he almost tripped. I managed to grab him and haul him back up, and off we went. Thank God, although the cave mouth was pretty small, we could see the light pouring through, and we were out. We didn't stop to catch our breath, though, collect our thoughts, or even bandage his hand that he'd caught on a jagged rock as he steadied his fall. We just ran, all the way to the truck, and drove away as fast as we could. I don't think we even spoke until we pulled up outside my house. We just looked at one another, and agreed to step climbing outside of caves and never go back inside one ever again after that.
Back in 2007 and 2008, I was staying in my uncle's ranch to escape a bad home life. The house was in the middle of nowhere, roughly 500 or so meters from a paved road. No streetlights or any other houses close around. Very few cars even passed by on the road. At the time, it was winter, so most of my days were spent inside watching TV when I stayed over. The closest neighbor to have livestock, really at all, would be about two miles away on foot and another mile into the woods, off-road. The ranch consisted of a two-story cabin. This is where my uncle slept, along with his wife and grandkids who stayed occasionally. There's a family room below the main level, two couches, a fireplace, TV, and a sunroom, which is where I would sleep. Luckily, with my uncle keeping the wood stove going, everything stayed pretty warm. Now, during this time of the winter, it hadn't really snowed all that much, and the cabin is surrounded by about 100 to 200 acres of forest, old pastures and trails, which in the spring and summer are a blast to explore. The large barns are not in use anymore. Most of the livestock was sold or taken back to my uncle's hometown, 20 miles away. One night, around late February 2008, I had fallen asleep on the recliner, unable to sleep upstairs where everybody else was, since I was binge-watching horror movies. It was about 3 a.m. or 3.30 a.m. I woke up, turned off the TV, and there was this strange light coming from outside. It caught my attention, and it was coming from the sunroom, which faced north, towards where the forest and pastures were located. The light shined in through all of our blinds, and made it very bright. It wasn't an outdoor security light. Those are green and shining at a lower angle compared to what this light I was doing. It was shining straight into the house. Now, the house is roughly only a hundred or so meters away from the woods, so you can make out shapes and animals pretty easily, but not details with top-notch vision. When I stood up, I couldn't see any shape or shadow being casted on anything inside, but I could see something coming from the south from the woods towards the house. And by the way, I did not disable any of our security measures when it came in that night. All the doors were locked pretty tightly, Plus, there's no way to get off the property without breaking a window or a lock. This was an animal, walking on two legs, which you can compare with how a man walks. But instead, with really long strides, more like running, faster than a horse's galloping. And it had to be at least six to six and a half feet tall from what I could tell. The whole time its head was pointed downward, not at me. I do remember seeing muscular arms, and they looked smaller compared to its size. The whole time I saw this, it was just moving towards the house, long strides, and then it got to about 50 yards away from me, and would have passed in front of the sunroom. The whole time this is going on, that bright light that was shining through the woods into our house was ascending up into the sky before it disappeared. I saw this thing lift its head up to look at me through the window. I still could not see its face. This is when I got a good look at its eyes. They were bright yellow, more like a moon or stars glowing, and they had slits for pupils. It was staring right at me, giving me this expression, and as soon as my uncle's dog began barking like crazy from inside the house, where everybody was sleeping, it stopped in place and just stared standing still. My body reacted automatically, grabbing a large kitchen knife where I kept close by. I still remember grabbing that specific knife. I always used it whenever I walked outside since it was my only weapon that made me feel safe. I knew I had to protect my family at all costs in order to keep this thing from getting in the house. I opened the door, gently closing it behind me and when I took my first step outside, the creature was gone, nor to be seen. I walked towards where it was headed, but couldn't find anything or hear anything. I know, I sound absolutely crazy for going out in the dark without a light, but 
being so pumped full of fear and adrenaline, and being ready for war. So I went back in the sunroom, put the knife back, and laid in the same spot, while staying awake for hours. This thing never came again. The light was gone. But had my family not been there, I would have chased it down until I killed it, or it killed me. When I told my family about what had happened, they didn't take me too seriously. I know, I sound crazy, but this was real. Just as real as the world around us. A few years ago, I had an absolutely terrifying experience that I will never be able to forget. I was 18 and a high school senior. I had just been accepted into college. To try and earn a little extra money for student living, i.e. beer, I'd taken on a delivery job on the weekends. It was all perfectly legal, but sometimes they had rush jobs, things that needed delivering ASAP, no matter what time of day or night, and these jobs always paid extra. So, I tried to pick them up as often as I could, and you could sometimes even make triple pay. It was late one evening during winter time, and I was hanging with some buddies when I got a message asking if I could make one of these particular drops. The address was a bit of a drive, but since I'd have to pass the local res on the way there and back, my buddy who lived on the res asked if he could come along, keep me company, and then I could drop him off on the way back. So we headed off to the depot, picked up the box, and headed off to the address. Despite being late and really dark, it all went swell, and before long, we were driving back towards the res, so I could drop my dude home. And that was when we saw it, sitting right in the middle of the road. It was around one in the morning, and as I said, the middle of winter. Total darkness out, except for my lights. But there, right in our path, was what looked to be some sort of huge bear. Only even the light of just a car. It did not look right. Like there was either something wrong with it, or it wasn't just a bear. Suddenly, my buddy shouted at me. Hit it! I was shocked. This dude who I'd known since kindergarten was the most gentle person I'd ever known. I'd seen him pick up a damn caterpillar off the path when we were kids, placing it carefully in a bush so nobody would step on it before he was telling me to hit this bear, which would not only injure it, if not kill it, but also risk our safety. What? And then he starts sort of almost praying, chanting, I don't know what to do for the best. I don't want to hit that thing or total my car, but I've never seen him act like this. So I'm freaking out and I put my foot on the gas. The closer we get to the bear, the more I notice that it looks really wrong and also that its eyes are glowing. And I'm not talking about the reflection from the car's lights. They were red. Then, as if it realizes what is happening, it opens its mouth. I'm expecting to hear this almighty roar, but the sound it makes is 100 times worse. It's a scream. To start with, I think it must have been my buddy, because this scream is 100% human, but still chanting under his breath. It wasn't me. And then the bear screams again, and literally seconds before impacting, it stands up. It must have been close to seven feet tall, leaping out of the way, and I miss it. I slammed on the brake, skidding to a halt, and my buddy comes out of his chanting trance to shout, No, keep moving now! And as I look in the rearview mirror, I see the red eyes again. I had no trouble hitting the gas and speeding out of there. Only when we got to the res and into his house did he stop with the chanting. I respected him and his heritage enough to know that it had been important and to not interrupt. But now, I needed answers. What was that thing? Why had he wanted me to hurt it? And what was he saying? He wouldn't tell me everything. He said he wasn't supposed to talk about it, but gave me just enough info to inform me that it wasn't a bear we encountered, but something called a skinwalker. He told me I'd have to look up the rest online, but in a nutshell, 
it was a very bad thing. He insisted on giving me a small bag containing some sort of talisman. Again, I wasn't to ask questions or open it. Just trust him and keep it with me. Having since looked into it, I see why he was so afraid. But again, although I have so many questions, most importantly, did he know who it was? Our friendship means more than me breaking his trust or respect by trying to get him to tell me more about it. I've been that way a ton of times, but after that, I've never come across anything odd or scary. I went away to college that summer, so I see less of him, except when I'm back on breaks. But I always keep that little bag he gave me in the glove box and check if it's still there before I head anywhere. I have always believed in monsters. I was the kid that checked their closet and under the bed, thoroughly expecting to find the boogeyman. I'd hold my breath going past cemeteries, never stepping on the cracks on the sidewalk, and you couldn't have paid me to go near a storm drain. However, despite being fully on board and terrified by their existence, I had never actually seen anything. It was one of those things where you don't need to see to believe. You know a gunshot is going to hurt. You don't need somebody to come and shoot you to prove it. And this was the same for me. I knew these things existed and actually hoped to God that I was never even proven right. See, when I was a kid, my parents thought it was just a normal phase and I'd grow out of it. I was still avoiding cracks and drains as a young adult. People just labeled me as a weirdo. It was fine. I still sleep with all the lights on. And after what I saw that day, I have a very good reason to. In fact, it's a wonder I even sleep at all. It was a miracle that I ever went to that farm, but even though the things I fear that go bump in the night are very real, I still had a day-to-day -day life to lead, and of course, work to do. At my day job, which is a bookstore clerk, I met this guy Sam, who was a regular customer. He's very nice, and his parents lived on a huge rambling farm with lots of land and acreage. I told him I loved horses, and he'd even invited me out to see his parents for dinner. I guess it was sort of a date. It still wasn't great. He had really wanted me to come and see his parents' mares. I guess it was a date. I still wasn't great with that sort of thing. Anyway, I ended up at this amazing sprawling old farmhouse, full of acres and fields, and most importantly, a stable full of beautiful horses. We had a great time, and I was thoroughly enjoying myself as with these things. I hadn't noticed how late it had gotten. It was already dark, and I had a little ways to drive home. I was just about to say that I needed to leave when there was a commotion from outside. The dogs were barking, and the horses whining. Since his parents were away for the weekend, Sam was in charge of the property, and more importantly, the animals. So, he grabbed a gun, and we headed out into the yard, by the stables to see if there was something like maybe a coyote sniffing around and getting the horses all worked up. The dogs were out there with us, sniffling around and yapping, and suddenly, they went completely crazy, barking, snarling, and trying like mad to get out of there in the fenced-off area that we were in and out into the meadows and woods that lay beyond. Sam was yelling at them and apologizing to me, saying that he'd literally never seen them act like this, but he just assumed there definitely must be a coyote out there and the dogs were just being protective. Then, the horses started neighing and kicking their stall doors. It all began to feel super weird. I just wanted to get out of there, but also didn't want to be on my own. Sam was more focused on the dogs in the woods, looking for the so-called coyote, and all of a sudden, he gives a shout and starts shooting into the tree line. Despite my fear, I run over to see what's going on. At that point, nothing untoward had crossed my mind. There were many perfectly regular and legitimate reasons for things to happen on farms, and of all kinds, like possible predators that could come sniffing around. 
none of which were remotely none of this world. But I had also always known that one day, I would finally come face to face with an actual real life monster. And it seemed it was that day. Standing near the tree line, but close enough for us to be able to make out that its features were clearly that of a giant wolf. It was standing on its hind legs, which were bowed like an animal's, but it seemed fairly steady. It must have been close to six feet tall, if not more, and everything about it was sturdy, like it was always very well fed. Its dark fur was almost shiny, despite the dark. I could even make out the whiteness of its fangs. But the one thing to really stand out, out of everything else in the dark, was the fact that it was standing up, like a person. Its eyes, which were glowing this bright warm red, like a hot poker that had been stoking a fire. Sam fired off several more shots, and we watched in horror as the shells connected with this thing, but made no difference. It didn't even flinch, just stood there as if the bullets were nothing. Neither of us could understand what it was doing, and then it appeared to speak. It used words, but nothing like we'd ever heard it before. This freaked me out even more than the eyes. The dogs seemed to understand, as they went from barking to trying to break through the fence, crying and rolling over into submission. We both looked back at the dogs and their unusual behavior for just a second, but when we looked back, this thing was gone. The language it was speaking was something you'd expect like a demon would. Phonetically, it sounded like guttural noises and kind of growling, a language I never heard before. But I would imagine if demons had their own tongue, that's what it would have been. The dogs got up, racing back into the farmhouse where we found them huddled together and cowering in the kitchen, shaking. The horses were unsettled, nickering and huffing, but no longer stomping about and did not calm down. Sam said he had never ever in his life seen anything like this or experienced anything close to this. He kept saying over and over that it just must have been a rabid wolf that he'd have to let the other farmers know and to be on the lookout. Now, I'm no expert in animal diseases, but this wasn't no case of rabies. At first, I thought it was a werewolf, but there was one important factor. It wasn't a full moon, and weren't werewolves supposed to come out on full moons? That left really only one conclusion, since the farm is an old Native American ground. This had to have been a shapeshifter, or a skinwalker. My story is short, but the time it covers involves several long years. I can't exactly tell you just how desperate I am to find peace over my experience. Finding somebody that will listen without judgment has been a tremendous struggle and no small part of my frustration. The other part is knowing the sort of evils that run free and the things they do to innocent people that just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I utterly hate confined spaces and I think that's one of the reasons my older cousin took every chance she could get to get me into a cave with her. It was always a cave or a closet or a tunnel or some small space that we weren't really supposed to be in. She loved to go exploring, and she loved to scare me to death in the process. She was like that as a child, and she stayed that way as she grew older. One day, she finally picked the worst possible place to explore, and she just had to get me involved. She said that she saw a shadow enter a cave in the deserts of New Mexico. We're natives to New Mexico, so the desert doesn't really faze me as much as caverns do. Most of the time, I could hold my breath and explore with her for just a few moments. But 
that eerie little story was an automatic no for me. Telling her no only made her try harder to persuade me. I don't know how she did it, but she sold me on going into that cave for five whole minutes. She said I could set the alarm on my phone and if it would help. However, I foolishly agreed. The cave entrance was wide and tall, as was the first chamber we found ourselves in. It was more spacious than I thought, and this lulled me into a false sense of security. A natural tunnel led on, and we went, and I agreed to go, feeling more calm than I should have. We both lit up the flashlights on our phones, and I instantly regretted it. There were skins stretched on the tunnel walls, and symbols painted onto them in some sort of chalky red substance. There was no airflow, but I definitely remember seeing the slightest movement in those same skins, as if by some diabolical means there was still some life in them. They didn't just sway, they were twitching and jerking. I pointed this out to my cousin, but she wouldn't even look. She was far too busy worrying about where the tunnel went next. I was beginning to panic well before the five minutes were up. The cavern felt inhabited by something wrong, and if the first tunnel had evil looking skin that still moved, the rest of the cavern couldn't have anything good. She got too far ahead of me, and I lost her. She traveled well beyond my phone's light. She yelled at me to pick up the pace, but I couldn't. Fear held me back like a lanyard. Suddenly, she was running towards me, but two very large gray hands with long and dirty nails closed around her face from behind her. One of the fingernails dug into her eyes, and she screamed as she dragged backwards. That pushed me over the edge. Everything that happened after that felt like a bad movie that I was watching from back of the theater. One of my legs wanted to run after her. One wanted to run to the cave entrance. It was complete mental agony that transcends anything I have ever felt before. I phoned the police and directed them to the remote location of this cavern. They didn't find any of the things I have described to them, not the twitching skins on the walls or anything, and they certainly found no trace of my cousin. I have since tortured myself by driving out to the location of the cavern and just standing nearby. If you've never experienced tragedy up close and personal like that before, then there's no point in trying to explain. It's like the way firefighters and soldiers will stand next to Ground Zero of the Twin Towers, even to this very day. It took me three years, but I finally saw something after all my pilgrimages to that cave. It was near sunset one evening when I saw a shape going towards the cavern at a fast clip. It looked every bit like my cousin. The resemblance struck me so hard that I forgot how to be afraid and I chased after her in a state that felt somewhat like sleepwalking. I called out to her as I ran for all I was worth to catch her before she went inside. She stopped just long enough to look straight at me and then disappear inside. It was her. It looked just like her. The eyes were bigger and darker than I remembered, but I didn't care. I had found her. It had to be her. I gave in to my foolishness again and bounded after her into the darkness of this cavern. My phone lit the way and I yelled for all I was worth. There were more skins than there had been three years prior. There was some that looked like hooded cloaks. I discovered to my horror 
that they were indeed human. The hoods were faces. They writhed and twitched in my presence. One of them, I swear, the empty face lifted and looked at me. Even though there were no eyes and no solid support, I recognized it right away. It was my cousin's skin. The mouth stretched and flexed and gaped, and a horrible wail sounded far off, as if her voice were coming from somewhere deep in the cave. I reported all this too. You can guess how they reacted, judging by how crazy and insane my story sounds. At the time, I was committed to an institution. The irony was that I needed the help after what I had seen. I can't talk about that experience with just anybody. There's too many people watching me to see if I might need to go back in for treatment. But the encounter is eating me alive, and I don't know why my cousin's skin is hanging on a cavern wall, and why it can scream. I don't know who is walking around with her appearance, and I don't know how long I could stay sane with the knowledge that something awful can happen to any person who ventures around here. My younger brother was really big on illegal hunting. He said that it was more fun when it was something you weren't supposed to be doing. Something about having something to hunt while watching out for being hunted by the law. Either way, he was a man prone to taking self-destructive chances. I went with him as an extra set of eyes. I'm sorry, but you just look out for your little bro. It's just the way it is. Plus, I didn't want him to pick a fight with any animal that's too big for him. He really was the stupid type. You know, the kind that would hit a bear with a stick just for the thrill of being chased by it. I found out the hard way that you really can't save a man from his stupidity if he doesn't want to be saved. And I've paid with having to live with the memory of what happened. In a strange way, I resent my brother for having no such curse. We were in a West Virginia timber that was as wild as you can get without it being too swampy. Life of all kinds was everywhere you looked. Of course, my stupid brother was there to shoot something. He wised up a little bit and took up bow hunting, something that requires far more skill than his dumb face could do. After telling him 500 times plus that loud noises draw the heat, he must have finally listened. He spotted an elk that he swore he couldn't do without. Even I had to admit that it was a very impressive animal. At the time, there wasn't a pass on hunting elk. The state was trying to build up their numbers. But this elk was a real looker. And I swear, the thing was looking directly into my brother's eyes. He thought so too. And there was no backing down for him. My brother threw all caution and stealth to the wind, sprinted after the elk with bow in hand. The animal was very peculiar about my brother. It didn't run, it trotted away, but it made no effort to lose my brother. My brother moved faster than I thought he could ever move, so I had some catching up to do. He had gotten way ahead of me, and I wasn't a young man. Not even then. I had to navigate a very steep hillside, full of young trees and saplings, which took me quite a while. My brother got through it like it was his element, which is why I was that much more surprised to see my brother standing at the top of a hill where it opened up into a flat, even glade, where one large tree dominated the center of the opening. I've seen some strange trees in those parts, but this one was like something from another world. The bark was black as tar, 
and it was bristling with spines long enough to be spears. When I caught up with my brother, he was standing in front of it, looking up into its wicked branches, and I noticed he wasn't holding his bow, and I was going to ask him what he did with it, when I noticed that one large spine impaled my brother to the mouth and erupted from the back of his skull. Somewhere in the fog of shock, I stumbled back just in time for a hunter's arrow to miss me by inches and strike a nearby tree. It was one of my brother's arrows. The bow was in the hands of something that had the elk's head, but everything from the neck down looked entirely human, at least mostly human. The exposed skin was a little too gray with hair and looked a little coarse, even from the distance that I was. I tried to reconcile what I was seeing with the earlier sight of an actual elk running on four hoofed legs. Now, there was this actor in a skin suit, and he really did wear a cape of skin. It was like a quilt of patchwork flesh. I think there was more than one animal in that cape too. But the arms and legs didn't quite look right to me. Or maybe the intensity of the moment distorted what I remember. I don't know. Either way, my brother died by his own weapon. Shot by something that went from four legs to two in the blink of an eye. I don't know how that works, and you couldn't pay me enough to go back into that wild wood to find out. I learned that day, there are just some things that are meant to be left alone if you know what's good for you. In the meantime, I'm still deep in the process of mourning. Me and my brothers were deep in rural Nevada and we were photographing everything. When I say we, I mean I. I was the shutterbug. That was back before digital was accessible. I lived for the experience of dropping my film off at Walmart and picking it up a few hours later. We were on the bus to our destination and it had slowed so we could get a look at the open spaces around us. I saw something that couldn't have been 100% natural. It was a wolf, or a coyote, but appeared to have ruby red eyes, and what I swear had been short antlers of some kind. I didn't ask anybody else if they were seeing the same thing. I was too afraid that it would vanish if I looked away. This is usually the point where something goes wrong with a camera but mine worked just fine. The animal even looked right at me as I fired off 15 shots. My last few shots coincided with the thing changing shape right in front of me and going from four legs to two. Suddenly, I felt like I held a million dollars in my camera. If those shots turned out good, I might be able to supply the world's first concrete evidence of something paranormal. However, the developed pictures came back and revealed nothing. The strange thing didn't even show up on film. Everything that had been around it was shown in crisp and sharp detail. Some of my best camera work actually. Each one looked like well composed nature shots, but the being, the subject in the photos were missing entirely as if they were 100% transparent and were gone like they had never been there. I'm not quite sure how to explain it either. One of the most terrifying things that I've ever experienced happened just a few months ago. It is also something that I was never able to fully explain. I got a call from my mother to say that my grandma was feeling poorly and I could run to the store to get her a few things and then drop them over. My mother was out of town for a couple of days and so 
I didn't really mind helping out. I headed straight to the deli and picked up the bits my mom had said to get and a couple of treats for my grandma. Some of her favorite candy and a couple of trashy magazines that she really liked reading. It didn't take too long, despite being fairly busy, and soon, I was heading out of the parking lot. It was this one-way system where you'd have to loop past the store to exit and get back onto the road. As I was driving past, I had to do a double take, because standing in front of the store, holding a bag of groceries, was Grandma, wearing her favorite purple leisure suit, and she smiled right at me. Now, the parking lot was backed up, so I couldn't slow down or block the road. I had no choice but to keep going. Although, I thought it was very odd that she was at the store when my mother had asked me to go. At that point, I wasn't worried, nor scared. Just confused, I guess. I drive fairly quickly, and I was soon at her house. Her car was parked by the garage, which, again, I thought was kind of strange. She drives at the speed of an old lady. How on earth did she beat me back? My mom had always made sure that my sister and I had the key to their house, and this one, just in case we ever needed to get in. So, I unlocked the door now and called out. Nothing. I let myself in and dropped the keys and groceries on the table. Then, I heard a groan from upstairs. Is that you? My grandmother asked. I hurried up there to see her. And there, lying on the bed, in her purple leisure suit, was my grandmother, with one ankle raised up and the size of a Christmas ham. Turns out, she twisted it that morning, which was why she called my mother. She could only just hobble to the bathroom, let alone anything else. There was no way in hell she'd been at the grocery store. So I made her some tea and sat with her for a bit listening to all the gossip from the neighborhood. I noticed that she looked real tired too. I asked her if she'd been sleeping okay. It couldn't have been from the ankle pain, since that had just happened. She told me that not too well. Now, I was feeling even more confused. See, my grandmother loves animals, but doesn't have any pets since there are a lot of commitment and since my grandfather passed, she likes to be able to just up and visit family without having to worry too much on who's going to feed her cats. The dog that keeps coming into the yard, she kept talking about. Night after night it comes. I have no idea where it's from, she said, as she has never seen it around. She paused for another moment, trying to decide whether to carry on. I inquired her more and asked her what is it. She told me that this is going to sound silly, but last night she gave it a treat and she had a funny feeling about it. This thing came right up close to her and was a whole lot bigger than any other dog she'd ever seen and then that she remembers distinctly that very moment that she had seen this thing's face and it was very human-like and had very big yellow eyes. This wasn't a laughing matter and she seemed genuinely frightened by the entire experience. So, for that, I'm not exactly sure. Although I never mentioned to her seeing her doppelganger at the store from what she had just recounted, I had a nasty suspicion that she had encountered some sort of skinwalker or shapeshifter who had copied her image. Thankfully, she had never saw that dog again, and both her ankle and general health had recovered after a few days of rest. Why this just happened, I have no idea, but I really have no doubt about what it was. If you're curious, 
My grandmother doesn't exactly live in town. She doesn't really have much neighbors either. Her backyard is full of rolling pastures filled with thick timber. So she gets all sorts of wild animals. In fact, many times, she's told me that that's more than enough than having her own pet. A few years ago, a buddy of mine suggested we go on a road trip. It was the end of summer before we headed back for our final years of college, and she wanted to do something fun and spontaneous. So, we threw some clothes in the bag, and off we went. We drove for a few miles, with no real clue where we headed, or even what we might do when we get there. But it didn't matter. This was freedom, and a spur-of-the-moment thing, that we'd likely never get the chance again, once we were headed off to law and medical school. After driving for around 12 hours straight, we found a motel and crashed for the night. Then, woke up and did it again. By this point, we were headed towards Nevada. We were having great fun. Wind in our hair, tunes on the radio. And as it began to get late again, we looked out for somewhere to stay the night. Although we were mainly sticking to the highways, even some of the main routes now were kind of lonely, and we often didn't see another car for miles. We were also careful on the quieter roads to be on the lookout for any wildlife that might wander into the highway. The last thing we wanted was to run over a deer or a coyote. Not only would it likely damage the car and make a hell of a mess when we were in the middle of nowhere, we were both animal lovers, and the thought of hurting something was abhorrent. So when I first saw the coyote or wolf, I wasn't sure which at first as it was pretty dark. I was sure to mention it to Callie, who was driving at that point, to be aware of it, and that was all. It seemed to follow us along the road for a bit, as if playing a sick game of chase, but I did think it was kind of cute. I wasn't sure how it was keeping pace, but we weren't going too fast. I suggested that it might have a lot of stamina. Callie began to feel slightly ill and at ease, so she put her foot on the gas to speed up ever so slightly. She was more inclined to acknowledge, whether it was a wolf, coyote, or some kind of wild rabid dog. It was a predator, and it was best if we lost it. But we didn't. Callie sped up, and it did too. What the hell? she had asked, ramming her foot onto the gas pedal and taking the speedometer up to 70 miles an hour. And it kept the pace, as if we were at a calm walking speed. We were freaking out. There was no way this animal should be able to do this. It was near impossible. I watched the speedometer climb up to 90 and even up to 100 miles an hour, and Callie looking as if she was losing control. And when I dared to glance out the window, it was still there, its face turned towards us. It was huge much bigger than what I would presume your average canine desert beast would average, and it had bright yellow eyes. They glowed like orbs. I held in a scream, and to this day, I don't know how I managed. I just knew at this speed, I couldn't startle Callie, or we'd wind up in a ditch. Then, all of a sudden, it was gone. She brought the car back down to around 70, and maintain that all the way to the stretch of lights and buildings that also included a Motel 6. We were both absolutely terrified, and it took us some time to be brave enough to leave the car and race over to the motel. Sensing our distress, the guy behind the check-in desk asked if we were okay, did we need any help? 
when we told him what had happened, he just nodded and suggested that we find a different route home. Looking at each other, we knew there was no way in hell we'd ever drive that stretch of highway again. Back in high school, I had a really good friend who lived on the res. His folks owned a farm out there, and sometimes I would stay over and help out with chores. I really liked animals and had wondered about maybe becoming a veterinarian someday. Since the property was surrounded by thick woodland and their cattle was their livelihood, they had plenty of fencing and traps laid out for any would-be predators, such as coyotes or wolves, something that might try and attack and hurt the herd. One of the neighbors had to have been on the lookout for some sort of mangy looking coyote, who was obviously getting braver the hungrier got, as it had been seen straying closer to the properties. I kind of felt a little sorry for it, not liking to think that any creature should be starving, even one that was likely to cause devastation if it was to get into the field. There was also the matter that several of the cows with calf, which made them slower as they were huge, therefore easier prey, and the fact that the family would be losing two creatures. So, all this meant they were being extra vigilant and on hyper alert for any evidence that the coyote was planning an attack. Which leads me to the reason that my friend and I were in the field that evening, complete with shotguns, hiding and waiting for the beast to appear. We planned to stay out there for a few hours, probably until we got too cold and earned some brownie points from his mom. It was just after midnight getting close to when we would call it a day, when we heard a noise. George's dad had installed security lights, and although it was not exactly lit up like Friday night on a football field, it still gave us an advantage. So, when we saw what we thought was a coyote, George got his trigger finger ready on the shotgun. Move back, he whispered to me, as he aimed at this thing. He fired one shot. The cows started mooing and shuffling about as we craned our necks to see if we'd hit the thing. And that's when to our horror, this thing stood up on two legs, just like a freaking person, and ran off. Although it was much taller than a coyote, which would normally stand on two legs, way, way taller than any dog would ever be able to be. We could see from the illumination from the security lights that this thing was covered in reddish hair and quick as a flash, it ran. George, seemingly unturned by this development, ran to the perimeter and fired off several more shots. I have no idea if he hit anything. He came back to me, then said we needed to get inside very fast. Waking up his parents, he asked if I wouldn't mind waiting in the kitchen for a moment, whilst he talked to them. I wasn't sure what to think. Had I really just seen a huge red coyote, person thing, standing on two feet, and then disappearing at the speed of light? When George came back into the kitchen, he looked frightened. He told me that he wasn't allowed to fill me in on much of it, because it was against tribal lore to share such things with outsiders, no matter how close I was to him and the family. I understood, as his traditions are sacred. All he was able to say was that I wasn't to come back until the place was safe. The creature we had seen was far more powerful and evil than I could ever imagine. I didn't ask any more, but when I got home, you bet I went and searched online. I looked and looked, and the only thing I could find was that of a skinwalker. Is this exactly what we encountered, or could we have encountered something more demonic?
First off, I'm not a professional and not exactly sure if these are skinwalkers. It was 2019, November I believe. I went hunting with my family and we own a huge farm. I would love to share where, but have been stalked before and that's still a fear of mine. Anyway, we set out around 5 in the morning, but that's not important. Later that day, finally, my cousin had shot one. A medium-sized buck, a four-pointer. It was growing dark as we got the buck into the garage to prepare. Anyway, as we were skinning the deer, the forest grew eerily silent. The only sound was light footsteps in the forest and coyotes howling off in the distance. By the time we finished skinning the deer, it was now pitch black. Just as we were about to leave the garage and go eat dinner, the door got stuck. My uncle was relatively mad and fought with it. He couldn't get the garage door all the way closed, but gave up. So we go eat, and then off to bed. I couldn't sleep. Something kept me up. I had the best bed. Warm temperatures. Everything was perfect. But I just couldn't sleep. My window was opened, and I was hearing crunches outside. Now, keep in mind, this is about one in the morning. I tossed and turned but nothing. Then the tapping and scratching started on my window screen. I was horrified. I grabbed my phone and shined the flashlight over to the screen. What I saw horrified me. It was the deer. The deer we had just skinned earlier. Not I forgot to mention, but this deer had a huge dent in its skull. We had no idea why, but on this imposter, the same dent was in the same place. I was slightly alarmed at the sight, and then I remembered. My window is six feet off the ground. I sat there, frozen in fear, and the thing let out a low growl and stared at me. I tried to ignore it, but fear overwhelmed me, and I then fainted. I woke up in the morning and ran over to the garage. The skin was gone. The only thing left was a pool of blood. The deer was still hanging up fine. I ran over to my window, and there were prints. Not deer prints. They looked like footprints, mixed with a deer hoof, and some type of deep indentation that could have been a claw mark. I grew up going to my non-blood related, very close family's friend uncle's cabin, which was on a lake connecting to many other lakes, which goes into a well-known chain of lakes in that region. Anyway, this was when I was about nine years old, and I had an extreme fear of being anywhere without my mother, since she was the only one around to take care of me and my siblings. This is because my dad had always been a heavy drinker and on deployment, but luckily not abusive. So, because of this, I was sleeping in the same bed as my mom on the ground floor of the old early 19th century cabin. It was raining outside and around 1 a.m. I could not fall asleep for some reason the window on the left of the bed was open with a screen on and my mother was fast asleep. I looked out the window to look at all the trees outside when I heard it. It sounded like the noise of a cliche monster would make, except this was booming across the entire lake outside the cabin. And since I'd been looking at the trees, I could see the trunks and branches vibrating from the roar that I had heard. Since it was so loud, I had no idea which way it came from, 
but I knew that I had heard it. When it was only me and my uncle and older brother. This time, I was 12. I told my uncle all about it, and he started freaking out. He had told me that the Native American artifacts and items had been constantly found around that area since long before it became a settled town. Ever since then, I've been able to notice strange things in the surrounding woods and lakes, especially while kayak fishing on my own during the dusk. Just small things, like an animal staring at me through the edge of the woods for at least 30 minutes at a time and following me when I got to a new spot. On one occasion, I was going swimming out in the middle of the lake. I'd gotten there by my uncle's jet ski, so from far away, it would be semi hard to spot me. I had been swimming around for 25 minutes when I noticed a man's head bobbing up and down in the water, all while staring at me. He had not been there before, and I hadn't or heard him seen him swim out there. Keep in mind, this is about a half mile from the nearest shore. Needless to say, I got the hell home after watching him for just a couple of minutes, just sitting there. My last experience that I will share was again when I was around 12. I was wakeboarding, which by the way is my favorite water sport. It was a gloomy day, so that could have very well contributed to this feeling. But every time I let go of the rope and waited for my uncle to turn around and come get me in that boat, I got the most strong feeling of being watched, more than I ever have in my entire life. I felt it all around me, from the trees, the murky black ice like water surrounding me, and the dark looming sky. I felt like I was going to be swallowed by the eeriness to the point that I almost began vomiting. The dark water was so cold, I couldn't even feel my legs. When I got back on the boat, I was shivering, and my uncle had thought the water was really cold, so he stuck his foot in. The water was warm, almost too warm to swim in. I felt the water, and it was warm, which was very different from the water I felt before. The clouds began to clear, and the forest around me began to look normal and warm. I don't usually go swimming anymore or go out alone in the lake to fish by myself. So, long story short, my girlfriend and I were swapping scary stories, and she told me about skinwalkers, which I'd never heard of before. When she told me what they were and showed me a few videos, I immediately thought of an experience that I had right about eight years ago when I was just 15 and my brother was 12. We grew up in rural northwestern Missouri, a little over an hour and a half north of Kansas City. We had two other houses on our road, both about a mile away but they were both quiet, elderly couples who I've never seen out past dark. All of the houses on our road, mine included, were surrounded by corn and wheat fields and trees on all sides. One night, I was lying in bed, trying to fall asleep, when I heard the most awful, blood-curdling scream outside my window. It sounded like a woman being brutally murdered in the road. Her scream was so garbled and desperate. I'm 5'3", and was a 15-year-old girl. So, obviously, I ran to my parents' room to tell my dad she needed help. They said they hadn't heard anything outside, which blew my mind, because it was so loud that it made my very blood run cold. Not five seconds later, my brother came running in, saying he was in his room and heard a woman screaming for help outside. At this point, 
my dad started to get concerned and ran outside. But there was nobody else around. I could usually see headlights through my bedroom window, so we were pretty sure no cars had gone by. There was no way she could have disappeared so quickly, especially judging by her screams. My mom, dad, and little sister, who was eight years old at the time, never heard a sound, but my brother and I still occasionally talk about it to this day, just because it was so weird and upsetting. My mom swears it was an owl, but I had heard screeching owls a handful of times while living there, and it was most definitely not an owl. I've been told that mountain lions sometimes make a noise like a woman's scream, but they're incredibly rare in that part of Missouri. Even growing up in the country with a forest behind my house, I'd only seen a mountain lion once in the entire 10 years I lived there. My mom has seen one, once, also in that same time frame, but we've never heard them. So, I guess it could have been a mountain lion, but I still don't think that's what I heard. Just a woman's scream that was way too loud and had something a little off about it. I appreciate any answers anybody might be able to give me. It was a crazy experience, and now that I look back on it, it's spooky, and it rendered me unable to sleep. I live in the Carolinas, and there are plenty of swamplands around here. You can't avoid them, but if you grew up around here, you know the rules, and don't go anywhere near them without being covered in bug spray. And watch out for snakes and alligators. But what if I told you I saw something down there once, which made me think I'd take 100 mosey bites instead? Let me tell you about it. You see, I was driving back from work one night when I noticed the car started pulling and I realized I had a flat. I pulled over and checked. Sure enough, one of the front wheels was flapping. I work in a bar and sometimes the patrons get a little feisty. Must have been a fight outside and some glass didn't get picked up and of course I had to drive over it. Now, I know you're always meant to carry a spare. It was one of around a million things I had on my to-do list which hadn't yet gotten done. So now, I'm stuck on the side of the road. Of course near the swamps, because I couldn't have broken down in town with all the streetlights and people around. So I'm trying to decide whether to call AAA or a buddy to come help out. And that's right when I hear this strange noise. Of course, being near Swampland in the evening, there are all sorts of noises. Creatures that live in there go about their business. But this sounded different. At first, I thought maybe somebody was just passing by. That someone had seen my car and pulled over further down the road, which I'd somehow missed, and now they were coming to help. Because that was what it sounded like. Footsteps. Wet footsteps. Like maybe somebody had been wading through water. I looked down the street both ways, but surprisingly, I couldn't see whoever was making the noise. But that was because I was obviously looking at the road. When I turned back toward the swamp, I saw exactly who, or more accurately what, was making the noise. It looked like a lizard, but not a regular lizard. That would have been too normal. But never fear, because this lizard was humanoid-like. I didn't know that at the time. I just stood there, with my mouth hanging open, doing all the usual things like pinching myself, rubbing my eyes to see if I was truly dreaming. I was unfortunately very much awake staring at what I can only say is this lizard man, or what I thought of him until I got home and tried to do some research. The best way for me to describe him is that he kind of looked a bit like an alligator, 
with two human-like legs, only with a much thinner body and long legs. It's actually quite hard for me to accurately describe. I guess because my mind wants desperately to try and make sense of what my eyes were seeing. Yeah, he looked really tall, easily like a regular person, but was very thick and scaly, really powerful looking arms and legs. His head was just like an actual lizard or alligator, long jaws with large teeth and a snout, eyes that bugged out on the sides of his face. He was just slowly wading through the swamp water, heading right for me in my direction. Now, I'm going to go ahead and hazard that guess that they don't teach shop or mechanics to lizard people, so I can only think that this thing was going to hurt me. So I grabbed my phone and keys, and I ran, as far away from the swamp and my car as possible, until I got to the safety of some houses and streetlights about a mile or so down the road. Then, I called one of my friends to come pick me up. Now, he is a lot braver, or more stupid. Then, he drives back with a huge pickup truck. When I told him what I'd seen, he immediately wanted to go back and check it out. The shotgun he had in the back made me feel braver, but uh, still, there was the risk. We headed back to my car, which was still exactly where I'd left it, so I guess this lizard dude wasn't into stealing my vehicle. My friend Nate jumps out of the pickup, shotgun in hand, and starts shouting and hollering. But of course we don't see anything. I have no idea exactly what that thing was or what it intended to do. All I knew was I didn't want to hang about and find out. But as I said, once I was feeling a bit braver, I looked, and not only did I find your channel, I found a lot of similar disturbing sightings. So it seems lizard men or alligator men gets around. And apparently, judging from your other encounters, there's a whole family of them living around here in the swamps up in southeastern America. There are some things your mom tells you that you should really listen to. Of course, when we were kids, we always think that we know best. But listen, there is often a reason why they tell you not to do certain things, but we usually end up finding them out the hard way. For example, my mother told us kids not to play in the stream at the bottom of the field because it was dirty and boggy, and you never know what you might find or catch in there. It was like telling us kids not to eat sweets because they'd rot your teeth out. Like a moth to a flame, we were drawn to the stream even more after being warned. So, one day, after a particularly rainy night, my little brother and I headed straight to the stream, knowing it would be overflowing, thus even more enticing. We played with sticks, trying to find newts, made newspaper boats, and did all of the things that any child would do near a stream. We pulled up our joggers and stomped in the muddy water. And that was when we saw the ripples. Ripples meant air, which meant something was living in there rather than just the water and flies we had seen so far. This made us excited. Now, I have no idea what to be expected in the muddy, boggy stream. But what came out of the water would blow our tiny 8-10 to 10 year old minds. It, or he, or they, must have been laying low on the ground under the stream, as when it stood up and rose from the water, there was no way he could have possibly been covered by that level of water otherwise. It was around our height, so about 4 feet or so, and looked like something straight out of a comic book covered in greenish scales, weird fins and gills. He kind of had a squat body and long bowed legs and thin arms and webbed hands and feet. I'm not trying to be mean. It was very amphibious looking, 
and it was kind of funny, but also frightening. Rising out of the stream was this creature, only he wasn't so little to us at the time, since he was around our size. My brother and I were caught between fear and excitement. Our mouths were wide open. It's not exactly what you would expect to see. I'd like to say that we weren't scared, but we were both terrified. We did not expect to see anything like that. He sort of just looked at us, unamused, then turned around and jolted off. We ran all the way home and didn't stop until we were back inside the kitchen with my mom, who just looked at us as if to say, See, I told you not to go into the stream. It's like deep down she knew we shouldn't have been there, and that maybe there was more dangerous things than what we could have thought. Of course now, this was so many years ago, but as an adult, it's fun to think back and realize that there are animals that exist that go beyond the realm of our imagination. I don't believe in Bigfoot, but I certainly do believe in undiscovered species of animals. As far as an explanation for what me and my brother saw, well, I have no idea what animal that was. People have asked me before if you ever really get used to living in gator country. I don't exactly know how to answer them. It's like asking if you ever get used to living around a hornet's nest. Sure, the sights and sounds will grow on you, but if you get stung, you get stung and it doesn't hurt any less if you've seen them once a week or once an hour. So it is with gators. You get eaten, you die, no matter how used you are to seeing them. I've been living in gator country for my 45 years, and I haven't lost any arms or legs yet. I do think I have lost some nerves with some close encounters I've had, and one in particular stands out since I'm not sure if I can really blame the gators for it. I had just enough southern comfort to make me braver than I should have been, and when I get brave, I like to go exploring. I want to take the canoe, the lantern if I need it, and go looking around. I know what a gator looks like, especially when it's trying to pretend to be a drifting log, and no amount of drink can blind me to it. It's a sight that I know by heart. But, I came across something entirely new, really. It's a miracle that it did not cost me my life, since I went in to greet death, eyes wide open. So, I'm out there exploring, driven by curiosity, fanned by the flame of a good buzz. The passages I could row down were getting narrower and narrower and the reeds were growing closer together. I came to a clearing where I swear I saw what looked like tall green pineapples growing up out of the water. They had the same overall shape and texture, except that they had something like scales on the outside, and the whole lot of things would twitch and bounce in a while. There was also the occasional burp sound indicating the expulsion of either air or fluids. If I had been smart or sober, I would have hightailed it back home. But I wasn't sober. Like a big kid that had just discovered big pine cones, I had to see what sort of secrets those big scaly green things held. My knife was barely any good on them. I could get the blade under a scale and peel it off without great effort. But that was it. The things were well armored. I was able to comprehend well enough that it was some sort of egg or embryo, but I didn't reflect long enough on what sort of thing made them and whether said thing would be nearby to protect the brood. At first, I thought it was a gator rearing up to attack me. Then I thought the whiskey might have been spiked with something stronger than just alcohol because I saw what could have passed as a gator walking on its two back legs, keeping its balance just fine and holding its body upright with the grace of a cobra. The head, though, 
was shorter than your usual gaiters, and the eyes were larger. The mouth also hung open a bit, and all the teeth you'd ever expect to see were there. But there was an alertness, an intelligence in those eyes that I'd never seen in any gator's eyes. It must have been Mama, and she was not thrilled to see me. I took out my dad's revolver, which was empty, and aimed it at my attacker. And she, or it, seemed to understand immediately, freezing in place. I abandoned my phone that I had just dropped in the water, and I ran. The last thing I remember was somebody calling my name from far away. After that, I blacked out. Apparently, my wife had come back looking for me when I didn't show up at nightfall. They had pretty much been on my heels when I was busy, tussling with my scaly little friend. I can't think of any other explanations as to why I'm still here. Whatever that thing was that lived in the swamp surely would have eaten me alive if it had just been me and her. I've never seen an alligator like that before, nor do I know exactly what it was. I feel weird for even using the term alligator. While it resembled an alligator, a lot of its defining features were very human-like. So was it an alligator man, dare I say? I don't know. And its eggs. I found its eggs, or embryos. Either way, I'm very disturbed, and hopefully this information will do better to you than it will to me. I was a part of a research expedition in the Amazon rainforest. We were looking for some indications that some plants could cure modern diseases. It's another big secret that the worldwide medical system needs all the help it can get. The locals had directed us to an especially dense grove of trees that produced these small strange yellow fruits. And no, not lemons. When taken back for research, it was found that early stage cancer cells dried up immediately by substances and proteins found within this particular fruit. And just to say my superiors were eager to get their hands and on only these fruits, but also on seeds of this particular tree so they could look into propagating them in a controlled environment as soon as possible. The natives had warned that not too much of the fruit should leave the grove at any given time. Otherwise, the forest would be angry. We thought that was a joke. Well, I was hoping that three small crates would not be considered greedy by the forest. I was nailing the last lid on the crate when we all heard a blood-chilling howl. Staring in between the trees were sets of large compound eyes that shifted colors primarily between green and yellow. They were set in faces that were mostly olive green with some molted gray and brown. At first, I made them out to be people that were covered in a great deal of war paint. Makes sense. Maybe we had disturbed the territory of some uncontacted Amazonian tribe. But then I saw that they weren't people at all. I saw teeth, like shark teeth, and lots of thick scales, claws that resembled meat hooks, faces that ranged from every structure resembling to a Komodo dragon to even modern crocodiles. I don't think I've ever ran so fast in my life. My veins were on fire, and my heart felt like it would have stopped at any minute. After a very long time, I looked behind me to see that the creatures were not pursuing me. I had tried to find my way back to that grove, and I never could. The expedition was considered a large-scale failure, and before we could leave the country, we were greeted by a Brazilian military who confiscated our three crates and took the expedition leader and nearly detained him before giving him a good talking. We were told and demanded to leave the country as soon as we could, and to never return. I'm not exactly sure why it was necessary for the Brazilian military to get involved. 
or why they felt it was necessary to confiscate the fruit and threaten us and demand we leave. Something is going on. I believe they knew something was up with that grove, and the warnings we had received prior about that same grove were probably in hopes that we would never venture to there. Who knows what we were not supposed to see that we had seen. I had taken a long fishing trip to a more isolated region of Alaska. Granted, every part of Alaska is considered isolated. A lot of places you can only reach by airplane. Where I was at was isolated, even by the standards of Alaskan natives. For miles in any direction, it was just me and waters and tall grasses and pines and blue skies. At least, that's what I thought. I was spending the night staring at the moon. There's something about it that's hypnotic and mesmerizing. I would then stare at the water. I would then see disturbances in the water. At the time, I just attributed this to the fish, which made me look forward to the catches during the day. But there were some things about the disturbance in the water that I could not account for. Protrusions above the water that didn't belong to any fish that I knew of. And believe me, if anyone knew fish, it was me. In the middle of one night, I woke up by virtue of some deep down instinct. I was in trouble, but I couldn't have told you why. I consciously stepped out of my tent and looked around. I didn't see any wolves or coyotes or bears, but when I looked towards the water, I saw some hunchback shape with a long tail. I could make out the silhouette of long claws a spiked dorsal plate that ran up and down the back all the way to the tip of the tail. At first, I gasped, thinking this was a real-life dinosaur that was probably hunting at night and would make sense since they were nocturnal. The movement of the water seemed very strange. That's when I realized that I was looking at more than one of the same creature. Perhaps dozens. They were pacing at the edge of the water. Each time I got something like a clear glimpse of their heads, they were turned toward me. I had a sinking sensation in my stomach as I was aware of the vast empty miles of wilderness that surrounded me. I could run for hours and not even see a single soul. I was alone out there with these things that were very much aware of me. Safe to say, I didn't sleep much the rest of that trip. A few of those nights, I didn't sleep at all. In the times that I did sleep, it was out of sheer exhaustion. I don't know why those dinosaur creatures never bothered to engage me. Maybe they were just guarding something, and they were making sure that this human being wasn't going any further. Either way, I still see those shapes stalking me in my sleep, circling me like sharks but that's probably my own fear and trauma of the experience. To this day, I honestly believe I saw real-life dinosaurs. I was driving home one afternoon through some thick farmland, admiring the open fields and thinking to myself how lucky I was to be able to have a steady job in the town and then come home to my house out in the countryside. It was a glorious springtime day when the sun was just about still shining and the trees were starting to look green and healthy again. I was just enjoying looking around and taking in the sights when I saw something run out in front of me onto the road. I never travel too fast for this very reason on the windy roads, as you never know what might spring out of the hedges, and I have had a near miss with a deer before in which I'm still not sure of which was more startled. This thing was far enough in front of me for me to be able to apply the brakes carefully and ease my already low speed without causing any issues. And there were no other cars about anyway. 
This also gave me the chance to be able to see what type of creature this particular jaywalker was. It was some sort of lizard reptile. That much I do know. And if I hadn't seen it with my own two eyes, I never would have even believed it was there. That would be because of the greenish scales covering its body. Where something like that had come from, or was heading off to, I have no idea. There is water around here, but not exactly huge lakes or swamps. Still, it was there, crossing the road. A reptile of which I had never seen the like before. You see, unless most of its kin, it wasn't slithering across the road, or scampering on four little feet like a gecko. No, this creature was strolling across the road on two feet. Upright, like a person. It appeared to have tiny legs and webbed feet, a long scaly body, and even tiny arms. It almost looked like a lizard, or an alligator had just decided that two feet would be the way to go. Its body looked all wrong. Not that there was anything even remotely normal about what I was seeing. It was more like a human torso, but covered in green scales with reptilian limbs. And then was the head. Have you ever seen the creature from the Black Lagoon? That odd-shaped head, with like flat gills on the side. Well, that was what it was on top of this messed up long human lizard. It wasn't that tall either, maybe three feet at most. Once it clocked the car, it turned and stared at me for a moment, bug wide eyes, never blinking. Then it sped off faster than I never would have thought. I sat there, my car idling, wondering what on earth I had just seen. It didn't appear threatening, and I wasn't exactly scared. More an awe and disbelief. After a few moments, when it seemed I wouldn't be making a return journey, I simply carried on my way home. But I'll never exactly forget what I saw that evening. A few years ago, I was on my way back from a work conference when I began to feel really tired. I knew myself well enough to recognize that I needed a break and to try and catch a few Z's before I fell asleep at the wheel. So I pulled over the road into a lay-by and just closed my eyes. I must have needed it, as the next thing I know, I jolted awake and checked my phone. I'd been out for nearly three hours, and now the sun was beginning to rise. Now it was brighter, and I could see that I had parked very close to some water. A lake, or a reservoir maybe. I decided to get out of the car, just for a minute or two, for a quick stretch, as my legs were all pins and needles, and I had a crick in my neck from not sleeping, properly. As I got out, I noticed the car had some footprints. It wasn't hard to notice as the paint job is white, and the prints were muddy. But there was something unusual about them. They were spaced out, as if whatever had taken a walk straight over my car had been on two legs, and even more bizarre, had webbed feet. For a moment, I thought about maybe a goose, as they have two legs and webbed feet. But on closer inspection, Although I am no expert on the size of bird feet, these prints looked much bigger, as if a man-sized web foot creature had used my car as a bridge. The footprints were also pointed towards the water, so whatever had gone over the car had more or less plunged straight in. I could then also see that there was a large puddle on the roadside where the footprints began. I stared out into the water for ages, trying to make sense of it. But no matter what, I just couldn't come up with a reasonable explanation as to why I had a man-sized lizard footprint on my car that just disappeared into the water. So, I listened to YouTube channels for a while, and I found yours. And you seem to know a lot of stuff about this particular subject. 
Would you mind sharing some helpful advice? Dogs can be a blessing and a curse. They are great when they come and lovingly wag their tail. And they are fun when you needed an excuse to get off your butt and go for a walk. They are not so great when they need to go out at 10 p.m., when it is cold, dark, and pouring rain. Especially when they need to go, and they've been trained not to poop in the yard. So that was why on a cold, wet, dark night, I found myself in the woods behind the house, cursing my dog who seemed to be constipated by the amount of time he was taking to find a decent spot. I stood there, stomping my feet and blowing on my hands trying to keep warm, trying not to notice the rain trickling down on the back of my jacket, when I heard some rustling in the trees, not on the side where the dog was though. After all, we were the ones trespassing at the time, which is why I wasn't worried. The nocturnal creatures were ready to come out and play, and the last thing they needed was to see a human and a huge dog that wouldn't make up its mind where to squat. And there was a sort of wet hissing noise. I know that sounds like an odd way to describe it, but that was what it was. A bit like when you go swimming and swallow too much water. More rustling and shaking of leaves, and I shouted at the dog to hurry up, or I was leaving him there all night on his own. Not that he understood or cared, but it's what we do. More rustling, and for the first time, I noticed that the rustling wasn't coming from the ground by around. It was the same height as around me in the trees. I thought it was odd, sure. It could have been a squirrel, but one may have been much higher up. And then, it stepped out. The first thing I thought was that it must be some kind of kid dressed up. It was too late to be alone in the woods, and Halloween wasn't for ages away. But as I was just good staring at it, I began to think that if it was costume or makeup, it was Hollywood-level special effects. From its feet to its head, it was covered in what looked to me because of the poor lighting. Brown, scaly skin. It was just a bit taller than me, and skinny as a rake, with long dangly arms and long legs like a supermodel would have. I didn't know if it was male or female. The torso was just flat, and I couldn't see any parts to give it a sex. Then was the head. It was flat and long, not round or oval like a person, but squat like an actual snake, with eyes on either side and huge lidless eyes. The dog noticed too, letting out a noise followed by a whimper while running over to me. That was enough to frighten off this snake and it kind of slithered off. I don't know how it could have slithered. It had long legs, but that's what the movement reminded me of. The dog began barking frantically and tried to chase this thing. I was able to grab him and pull him back to the house. He was at my heels when we got inside. He whined and begged and acted crazy for a while. Now I can't drag him into those woods when it's dark. I can't have imagined it if the dog saw it too. That must mean we really did see something out there that we can't explain. I'm pretty confident what lurks beneath that I am not hallucinating. What are your thoughts on my encounter? <laughs>